Well, here we are again. We want to continue our study of Daniel's little sealed book. And basically, we have been discussing the fact that the book of Daniel is composed of two books. The first book is Daniel 1 through 7. The second book is Daniel 8 through 12. Now, we have not proved that Daniel 8 through 12 is the second book, but we have discussed Daniel 1 through 7. And we notice that uh, these chapters are interrelated, interconnected. Daniel 2 and 7 are connected, Daniel 3 and 6 are connected, and Daniel 4 and 5 are connected in terms of theme, and Daniel 1 would be the introduction. So you have a candelabrum, what is called a chiasm, if you please. Now, uh, we were also discussing the sequence of powers in Daniel 7, and uh, we're, we're going to our material now. The sequence of powers was Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Rome divided into ten kingdoms, then the little horn, which is Papal Rome, which rules until 1798, and then after 1798 we have the judgment. We have the beginning of the judgment. And where does that judgment take place? It takes place in heaven. Does it take place before the second coming of Christ? Yes, yes because the Son of Man goes to the Ancient of Days to receive the kingdom before he comes here to take over the kingdom. He goes to the Ancient of Days to receive the kingdom, so the investigative phase of that judgment takes place in heaven, and then the time comes when Christ and the saints take over the kingdom, according to Daniel 7. Now, that description of Jesus coming to the Father, to the Ancient of Days, is found in Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10, and 13 and 14. I'd like to read those verses. Daniel 7, 9 and 10, and 13 and 14. It is in your material. It says here, I watched till thrones were put in place. This is after the little horn rules for 1260 years. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, a thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, the court was seated, and the books were opened. Where is this, where is this judgment being um, enacted? In heaven. Now notice verses 13 and 14, after the Father moves, then you find this, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, He came to the Ancient of Days. Where was the, where is the Ancient of Days? In heaven. in heaven. We pray, Our Father which art in heaven. The Ancient of Days is in heaven. So the Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days. Where is this judgment taking place? It's taking place in heaven. And so it says, One like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, He came to the Ancient of Days, and they, that is the clouds, the angels, brought him near before him, and now notice, then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. So Daniel 7 has something very interesting. It has the sequence of powers that will rule in the world till the time that Jesus takes over the kingdom, empirically when He comes to take over the kingdom. But there's something in Daniel 7 that was not understood until after 1798. You see, before 1798 it was believed that when Jesus came He would take over the kingdom, but they did not know, they did not realize that a judgment is going to take place in heaven before Jesus takes over the kingdom. You know, that's one point that was not understood before 1798, the judgment aspect. You see, before uh, 1798, uh, basically they believe that the judgment is when Jesus comes. Somehow, even the Millerites did not understand because William Miller used Daniel chapter 7 to speak of the second coming of Christ, even though it says that the Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days. They did not fully understand that before Jesus comes to empirically take over the kingdom, there was going to be a judgment that would declare Jesus, Jesus' right to have the kingdom in the heavenly court. Are you understanding what I'm saying? 
So there was one aspect of Daniel chapter 7 that was not understood before 1798, and that was the judgment aspect, the heavenly judgment aspect of uh, the taking over of the kingdom. Is that point clear? Now that is very important for what we're going to discuss next. Let's discuss now the second book. We've already discussed the first book. The first book ends by saying that there's going to be two phases to the judgment. One, a heavenly phase where Jesus will be given the kingdom legally in a court of law, and then the time when Jesus actually takes over the kingdom that He was legally given in the court of law. Now let's look at the second book. Daniel 12 and verse 4 says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now the big question here is this, which book is Daniel 12 verse 4 referring to? Is it referring to the entire book of Daniel, or is it referring to the second book within the book, which is Daniel chapter 8 through 12? That's what we want to pursue. Now it says clearly here that the book would be sealed until when? It would be sealed until the time of the end. But at the time of the end what would happen? The seal would be removed and knowledge would be increased. Not scientific knowledge, but knowledge of the book, because at the time of the end the book would be opened, and now people would be able to understand what was in the book that had been sealed in the days of Daniel. Are you following me or not? This is very, very important. Now, there are five reasons that I want to give you that prove that the entire book of Daniel was not sealed until the time of the end. The only portion of Daniel that was sealed until the time of the end was the content of Daniel 8 through 12. And so that is the book that was sealed until the time of the end. It is the book within the book. Now let's pursue this so that you understand this very important point. Reason number one, there is evidence that Daniel chapters 1 through 7 was understood to a great degree long before the time of the end. Notice the words of the church father Hippolytus who wrote in the third century AD. Now you tell me if he understood to a great degree Daniel 7. This is what he says, In speaking of a lioness from the sea, Daniel meant the rising of the kingdom of Babylon, and that this was the golden head of the image. Then after the lioness he sees a second beast like a bear, which signified the Persians. For after the Babylonians the Persians obtained the power. And in saying that it had three ribs in its mouth, he pointed to the three nations, Persians, Medes, and Babylonians, which were expressed in the image by the silver after the gold. Then comes a third beast, a leopard, which means the Greeks. For after the Persians, Alexander of Macedon had the power when Darius was overthrown, which was also indicated by the brass in the image. And in saying that the beast had four wings of a fowl and four heads, he showed most clearly how the kingdom of Alexander was parted into four divisions. For in speaking of four heads, he meant the four kings that arose out of it. For Alexander, when dying, divided his kingdom into four parts. Then he says the fourth beast was dreadful and terrible, it had iron teeth and claws of brass. Who then are meant by this but the Romans, whose kingdom, the kingdom that still stand, stands, is expressed by the iron? For says he, the lay, its legs are of iron. Did Hippolytus understand Daniel 2 and Daniel 7? Yes. Oh yeah, to a great degree. Now you say, ah, but he didn't understand the, the Antichrist. Oh yes he did. But there's one thing that Hippolytus missed. Let's read his second quotation. By the way, for those who are interested, this is found in Leroy Edwin Froome's uh, book, The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, Volume 1, page 272. This is what Hippolytus said in the second statement. Let us look at what is before us more carefully and scan it, as it were, with open eye. The golden head of the image is identical with the lioness by which the Babylonians were rep represented. 
The golden shoulders and arms of silver are the same with the bear, by which the Persians and Medes are meant. The belly and thighs of brass are the leopard, by which the Greeks who ruled from Alexander onwards are intended. The legs of iron are the dreadful and terrible beast by which the Romans who hold the empire now are meant. The toes of clay and iron are the ten horns which are to be. The one other little horn springing up in their midst is the Antichrist. Interesting. Was he right? Of course he was. The stone that smites the image and breaks it in pieces and that filled the whole earth is Christ who comes from heaven and brings judgment on the world. What's missing? What's missing here in his description? For him, when is the judgment? When Jesus comes from heaven and brings judgment on the world. What is he missing? He's missing the pre-advent judgment. He did not understand the pre-advent judgment. But did he understand everything else. He understood everything else. So was Daniel 7 sealed until the time of the end? No, there was one aspect that was sealed until the time of the end, and that is the investigative judgment phase after which Jesus would take over the kingdom. Now the evidence in these quotations indicate that Hippolytus understood everything about Daniel 7 except the investigative pre-advent judgment. It should be noted that even some portions, this is important also, that even some portions of Daniel 8 through 12 that were fulfilled before the time of the end could be understood before that time. The historical sections of the book could certainly be understood. The meaning of the ram and the he-goat of chapter 8 were understood before the time of the end. Is that correct? Of course, because Daniel tells us who. <laughs> who these beasts represent, the ram and the goat. He says the ram represents Medo-Persia and the goat represents Greece. You don't have to wait till the time of the end to understand that. So even some portions of Daniel 8 were understood before the time of the end, but there's one aspect of Daniel 8 that wasn't. Let's continue. Much of the earlier portions of Daniel 11 could be understood before the time of the end, as can be seen by the fact that the pagan philosopher Porphyry argued to the church father Tertullian that the first half of Daniel 11 describes so precisely Greek and Roman history that it had to have been written in the second century rather than in the sixth century. So Porphyry said this is too detailed, this could not have been written 400 years before it happened. So somehow Daniel must have been written in the year 200 BC. So were there portions of Daniel 11 that even the pagan philosopher Porphyry could understand? Of course. But there is one specific element of Daniel 8-12 through 12 that could not be understood by anyone until the time of the end, and that was the message concerning the 2300 days and the judgment. These things were sealed until the time of the end because only then would it be true that the judgment had begun. Are you with me? I want to make sure that you're following along here. What is the only thing that was not understood? 2300. The, the 2300 days and the investigative judgment. Now let me give you a second reason why uh, you're dealing here with two books rather than just one book. Now I realize that Daniel is one book, but there are two books within it. The book of Daniel was written in two different languages. Chapter 1 which is the introduction to the entire book, was written in Hebrew. Chapters 2 through 7 were written in Aramaic, which was, you know, somewhat like Hebrew. It's kind of like Portuguese and Spanish, Aramaic and Hebrew. And so chapters 2 through 7 were written in Aramaic, and chapters 8 through 12 were written in Hebrew. The difference in language between Daniel 2 through 7 and Daniel 8 through 12 indicates that the book is composed of two units. Reason number three, the little old lady. <laughs> Ellen White knew this. Uh, you know, I never ceased to marvel at how Ellen White understood this. You know, most people they say, oh, you know, the book that was sealed until the time of the end was Daniel. Ellen White didn't make that mistake. She didn't say it was Daniel. 
Let's read several statements from her writings. This is Acts of the Apostles, page 585. In the Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet an end. Here is the complement of the book of Daniel. One is a prophecy, the other a revelation. The book that was sealed is not the revelation, but that portion. Hmm. What is a portion? Part. But the portion of the prophecy of Daniel relating to the last days. The angel commanded, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. So is the book that was sealed all of Daniel? No, it is that portion having to do with the last days. In another statement, Great Controversy, page 355, Ellen White explains the message of salvation has been preached in all ages. But this message, she's talking about the first angel's message, it says the hour of his judgment has come. But this message is a part of the gospel which could be proclaimed only in the last days, for only then would it be true that the hour of judgment had come. And now listen to what she says. The prophecies present a succession of events leading down to the opening of the judgment. Daniel 7 does that, right? Daniel 7 presents a succession of events leading down to the opening of the judgment. This is especially true of the book of Daniel. Now listen carefully. But that part of his prophecy which related to the last days, Daniel was bidden to close up and seal until the time of the end. Not till we reach this time could a message concerning the what? The judgment be proclaimed based on the fulfillment of these prophecies. But at the time of the end, says the prophet, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So in one statement she says that portion was sealed, and in the other statement she says that part. So the book that was sealed was not all of Daniel. It was a portion having to do with the 2300 days, and that is the central theme of Daniel 8-12. through 12. We're going to study that. Desire of Ages 234, the words of the angel to Daniel relating to the last days were to be understood in the time of the end. At that time many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. The wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now here's a very interesting statement, Manuscript Releases, Volume 1, page 99. Uh, you remember that, that the seal was taken off the book and the book was opened in Revelation chapter 10? Remember that the angel descends from heaven with a book that's open, having been opened? Was the seal taken off that book? You know what that book is? It's this book. That portion of Daniel is that book. And the angel comes with the book open because the seal has been taken off. Now listen to what Ellen White says about what the seal was. She says, the unsealing of the little book was the message in relation to time. Which time? <laughs> Unto 2300 days the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So when the 2300 days are preached, what happens with the seal? The seal is removed and now people can understand it. Are you following me? So what is it that was sealed? the message in relation to time, the 2300 day prophecy. Now here's another statement, this is Prophets and Kings, page 547. She says, honored by men, with the responsibilities of state, and with the secrets of kingdoms bearing universal sway, Daniel was honored by God as his ambassador, and was given many revelations of the mysteries of ages to come. His wonderful prophecies, as recorded by him in chapter 7 to 12 of the book, bearing his name, were not fully understood even by the prophet himself. But before his life labors closed, he was given the blessed assurance that at the end of the days, in the closing period of this world's history, he would again be permitted to stand in his Latin place, that is through his book of course, not personally. It was not given him to understand all that God had revealed of the divine purpose. 
shut up the words and seal the book he was directed concerning his prophetic writings. These were to be sealed even to the time of the end. Go thy way, Daniel, the angel once more directed the faithful messenger of Jehovah, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. So what is it that was sealed until the time of the end? The entire book of Daniel? No. It was the portion of Daniel that has to do with the 2300 days. That has to do with the beginning of the judgment, the chronology of the beginning of the judgment. That was sealed. Other things could be understood. Could they understand the lion? Sure. Could they understand the, the, the bear? Could they understand the leopard? Could they understand the dragon beast? The ten horns? The little horn? Even Martin Luther and the reformers, you know, they, uh, Martin Luther believed that the little horn was Islam, but other reformers believed that the little horn was the papacy, and the man of sin was the papacy. And so these things could be understood. Could they understand that the ram represented Medo-Persia? Sure. Could they understand that the he-goat represented Greece, and that Greece would be divided into four kingdoms? Absolutely. Daniel 11, as we notice, could be understood, at least the portions that didn't have to do with the last days. Which was the portion that could not be understood? Ellen White says, that which had to do with the last days, with the investigative judgment, with a 2300 day prophecy. Now let's go to reason number four. This is the most important of all, and I hope that you're well versed in Daniel 8. I hope that you've read Daniel 8, you know what the sequence is, uh, because uh, that's going to be very important to understand what we're going to go through now. What I want to show you now is that the internal evidence of Daniel 8 through 12 proves beyond any doubt that this little book that was sealed until the time of the end is composed of these chapters. In fact, we're going to take these chapters one by one, beginning with chapter 8, and we're going to see that each one of these chapters in some way is related to the 2300 day prophecy. Now, Let's begin with Daniel 8. In this chapter, the 2300 day prophecy is introduced. The chapter begins in the time of the kingdom of Persia, right? There's no symbol for Babylon. Why is there no symbol for Babylon? Because the 2300 days begin with Persia. So if you put in Babylon, you're, you're taking a kingdom the vision would include a kingdom before the 2300 days begin their chronological period. That's the real reason. So notice, the chapter begins at the time of the kingdom of Persia, continues with Greece, the four divisions of Greece, pagan and papal Rome, all the way down to the conclusion of the 2300 days when the process of cleansing the sanctuary will begin. Are you acquainted with the broad, broad sweep? Yep, you have Ram, Medo-Persia, then you have a he-goat, Greece, then the he-goat grows four horns, those are the four heads of the leopard by the way, they grow four horns, and then arises a little horn, which at first is pagan Rome, it grows horizontally, and then it uh, grows vertically towards heaven. In other words, Rome morphs from a political power into a religious power. And then it takes you all the way down to the time of the cleansing of the sanctuary. So Daniel 8 gives you the broad sweep from, from the time of Persia till the time when the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. 2,300 days, which we understand as years. Now I want you to notice that there are four differences between the prophecy of Daniel 8 and those of Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. They are somewhat parallel, but there are differences. First, while in Daniel 2 and 7, the prophetic series begins with the kingdom of Babylon, that is the gold and the lion, in Daniel 8 there is no symbol for the kingdom of Babylon. Interesting. The usual argument given for the this difference is that the kingdom of Babylon was about to pass away. But the date given in this chapter indicates that the kingdom of Babylon would not pass away for another 12 years. So Babylon was still going to rule for 12 years, there has to be another reason. And the reason is 
that it had to begin with Persia because that's when the 2300 day prophecy begins. Second, in contrast to Daniel 7, the beasts of Daniel 8 are domestic sanctuary animals. What kind of beast do you have in Daniel 7? Carnivorous beasts, wild beasts. But in Daniel 8 you have sanctuary beasts, because the central theme is the sanctuary. The ram was used in the daily service, while the he-goat was used in the yearly service. This strongly hints that the central theme of Daniel 8 is the daily, is the daily referred to very clearly there? Yeah, leading up to the end of the 2300 days, you have the little horn taking away what? The daily. That's the ram. But that's not all. And the yearly, in which the little horn is what? Judged. Are you, are you following this? In other words, two sanctuary animals are used to illustrate that the papacy was going to take away the daily, and as a result, the papacy was going to be judged in the yearly service which is the cleansing of the sanctuary, or the judgment. Third, there is only one symbol in Daniel 8 for both pagan and papal Rome, a little horn. The horn first spreads out horizontally, that is geographically, to the east, the south, and the glorious land. And then it extends vertically to heaven. That is to say, it first extends politically and geographically, and then religiously. It is clear that the introduction of another beast into Daniel 8 to represent pagan Rome would have spoiled the symmetry of the chapter which emphasizes the two beasts of the sanctuary service. So if a third beast had been introduced it would ruin the, the theme of the daily and the yearly, the two beasts of the sanctuary. Fourth, this is very important, there is no reference in Daniel 8 to the establishment of Christ's everlasting kingdom. Does Daniel 2 refer to the setting up of Christ's everlasting kingdom? He will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. That's the culmination of the vision of Daniel 2. Does Daniel 7 end with Jesus taking over the kingdom? Yes it does. But Daniel 8, strangely enough, the chapter ends and there's no reference to the everlasting kingdom, which is different than Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. Now this was due to the fact that Daniel got sick before Gabriel was able to explain the entire vision. And you can read that in chapter 8 verses 26 and 27. This is the reason why Gabriel came back in Daniel 9 through 12 to explain the things that had remained unexplained in chapter 8. In other words, if Daniel had not gotten sick, Gabriel would have continued giving him Daniel 9, 10, 11, and 12. But he gave it later. Now, what is the central theme of Daniel 8 then? What is the central theme of the vision? Unto 2300 days the sanctuary shall be cleansed. That's a central theme, right? The 2300 days and the judgment. Now, let's go to our next page. What is the central theme of Daniel 9? Now here we have a problem in Daniel 8. What is the problem in Daniel chapter 8? The problem is that you have a 2300 day prophecy but you don't know where to start it. We want to know when the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. 2300 years and the sanctuary will be cleansed. The problem is there's no starting point in Daniel 8. So where would you expect to find the starting date? How about the next chapter? Are you with me or not? So in chapter 9, Daniel 8 mentions the 2300 day prophecy but does not provide a starting point. In chapter 9 the crucial starting point for the 2300 days is given. The 70 weeks constitute the first 490 years of the 2300 day prophecy and those years begin during the kingdom of Persia. This is the real reason why the kingdom of Babylon is not mentioned in Daniel 8. It is because the 2300 days begin during the reign of Persia and not during the reign of Babylon. 
So far so good? See, there's a reason for all this. Is it important to know the literary structure? Oh. Indispensable. So then Daniel 9 gives you the starting point for the 2300 days. So what is the central, what is the central purpose of Daniel 9? To give you the starting point for the 2300 day prophecy. So is Daniel 9 related to Daniel 8? Yes. Absolutely. Now, could the 70 weeks be, be understood before the time of the end? Yes. Because they were fulfilled before the time of the end. But what could not be understood until the time of the end? that the remaining 1,810 years would take you to the investigative judgment. So the portions that were fulfilled could be understood. What could not be understood is the ending point, the cleansing of the sanctuary, the end of the 2300 day prophecy, that there was going to be a judgment in heaven before Jesus came to take over the kingdom on earth. Even the Millerites did not understand that. Wow. Okay, so let's go to Daniel 10. Does Daniel 10 have anything to do with the 2300 day prophecy? Of course it does. Let's read it. In order for the prophecy of the 2300 days to be fulfilled, especially the 70 weeks, it was necessary for the kings of Persia to give certain degree decrees for Israel to go back to their land, to rebuild their temple, city, walls, and to restore a functioning Hebrew theocracy. It was the command to, to build and restore Jerusalem. Certain decrees had to be given in order for the 2300 day prophecy to begin on time. Now Satan, the prince of Persia, knew this. Do you think the devil could understand the prophecy of the, seven, of the 70 weeks and the 2300 days? You better believe he could. So he says, if I, can, if I can skew the starting point, I can eliminate the ending point. Now notice, Satan knew this, and therefore he worked on the minds of the Persian kings to try and prevent them from allowing Israel to return to their land. Do you know that after Israel returned in 536, there was all sorts of opposition. Cyrus gave a decree and then it was revoked. And then it was reinstated. The people that had remained in the land fought those who came back tooth and nail. Why do you suppose that was? because the devil was behind it. Daniel 10 gives you the reason behind the reason. Now notice, I'll continue reading here. If the temple, the city, and the walls were not rebuilt, if the theocracy was not reestablished, the prophecy of the 2300 days could not begin to be fulfilled, and God's plan would be frustrated. But in the end, Michael came to help Gabriel, and the prophecy of the 2300 days began right on schedule. Amen. Is Daniel 10 related to the 2300 days? Yes. Yeah, it's the, it, there's a battle going on in Daniel chapter 10. The prince of Persia, who is the devil, is struggling with the kings of Persia. What he's doing is he's trying to convince them not to favor the, the Jewish people and not to give them, and to tell them, you revoked that decree. You know, even Artaxerxes gave the decree and then he revoked the decree and then he reenacted the decree. I don't know if you were aware of that. But there was huge opposition because the devil did not want the 2300 day prophecy to begin on time. Now, notice what Ellen White says in Prophets and Kings, page 571 and 572. She explains what was going on. While Satan was striving to influence the highest powers in the kingdom of Persia to show disfavor to God's people, angels worked in behalf of the exiles. The controversy was one in which all heaven was interested. Through the prophet Daniel we are given a glimpse of this mighty struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. For three weeks Gabriel wrestled with the powers of darkness, 
seeking to counteract the influences at work on the mind of Cyrus. And before the contest closed, Christ himself came to Gabriel's aid. And you know what Michael said after this? He says, I've got to go now because I've got to continue struggling with the kings of Persia. So is chapter 10 related to the prophecy of the 2300 days? Yes, yes it is. This is a book within a book. All of the chapters have the same central theme, the 2300 day prophecy. Now we need to go to chapter 11. In chapter 11, what kingdom does this chapter begin with? Persia. With which kingdom did Daniel 8 begin? Persia. Do you know what's going to happen now in Daniel 11? <laughs> there is no new vision in Daniel 11. Are you aware that there's no new vision in Daniel 11? What Gabriel does, he comes back and he now says to Daniel, Daniel, you got sick and I wasn't able to finish. Now I'm going to start where I started in Daniel 8, but I'm going to take you all the way to the end. Is that clear? And so, and so now he's going to go back to where Daniel 8 began, and he's going to take Daniel, he's going to give Daniel the sweep, but he's not only going to take him to the point of the ending of the 2300 days, he's going to take him beyond that to the final conflict and to the establishment of Christ's everlasting kingdom. Which he did not have the kingdom in Daniel 8 because Daniel got sick. So in Daniel 11, Gabriel is going to say, I'm going to show you the whole sweep, and I'm going to end with the everlasting kingdom, which I did not end with in Daniel 8. So let's read this. Now that which was begun and not finished in Daniel 8 will be completed in Daniel 11. As in Daniel 8, the vision of Daniel 11 begins during the kingdom of Persia, not Babylon. It continues with Greece. You can read this in Daniel 11, it's clear. It continues with its first king and the four divisions of Alexander's empire. It then describes the dominion of pagan Rome. Then it describes papal Rome in both of its stages during the 1260 years and at the end of time. Verses 40 to 45 describe the papacy after the deadly wound is healed. The, chapters, the verses before that, verse 31 through verse 39, describes the career of the papacy during the 1260 years. But now notice. But instead of taking us merely from the time of the kingdom of Persia to the end of the 2300 days in 1844, is that where Daniel 8 ended? On to 2300 days the sanctuary shall be cleansed. That takes you to 1844. But now in Daniel 11, instead of taking Daniel only to 1844, he's going to take him all the way to the time of the establishment of the everlasting kingdom. He's going to take him to the time when the judgment ends and the time of trouble comes and God's people are delivered and Christ establishes His everlasting kingdom. Instead of taking us merely from the time of the kingdom of Persia to the end of the 2300 days in 1844 when the judgment begins, Daniel 11 takes us all the way from Persia to the end of that judgment and the close of probation when Michael stands up. So does Daniel 11 take you far beyond 1844? It most certainly does. And finally, in Daniel 12 verses 2 and 3, you have a description of the climax when God's people will resurrect and inherit the everlasting kingdom and the righteous will shine as stars forever and ever. Thus Daniel 11, 1 through 12, 3 take us full circle from the time of Persia till Christ sets up His everlasting kingdom. Isn't this incredible? So what is the central theme of all of these chapters? The central theme, folks, is the 2300 day prophecy, the judgment. All of the chapters have the same central theme. And much of this, the judgment aspect, could not be understood until the time of the end. So is this a book within a book? It basically what it's doing is Daniel 7 gives you the inkling. It introduces it when it says that the ancient of days goes in and he sits and the judgment is set and then the Son of Man comes. He's taken before the, before the ancient of days 
the judgment sits and the books are open, Daniel 7 at the end of the chapter gives you the introduction to the second book. The idea that the judgment is going to be in heaven and the judgment is going to be before the second coming of Christ. Now let's go to reason number five. And we're going to amplify this one uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left in this particular presentation. Uh, but we are going to, we're going to deal with uh, Revelation chapter 10 more extensively in our next session. But let's go through the material that we have here. The opening of the little book in Revelation 10 is a clear reference to the unsealing and opening of the book that was sealed in Daniel 12 verse 4. There is only one book in the Bible that was sealed to be opened at the time of the end. Notably, the little book of Revelation 10 is opened in the period of the sixth trumpet at the very end of history, immediately before Jesus takes over the kingdom at the time of the seventh trumpet. Are you catching the chronology? In other words, the little book is opened during the period of the sixth trumpet. That's when you have the eating of the book, it's sweet in the mouth, bitter in the stomach, you know. And then after that, you have the, the, the episode of Christ taking over the kingdom under the seventh trumpet. Now, we shall find in our next study that no chapter in the Bible explains in a clearer way the origin, message, mission, and destiny of God's end time remnant people than Revelation 10. It is no coincidence that the central theme of the Millerites who preached at the beginning of the time of the end was drawn from Daniel 8.14 and Revelation 14.6 and 7. The eating of the little book of, Re of Revelation 10 clearly indicates the judgment hour preaching of the Millerite movement and its subsequent disappointment. Let me ask you, did the Millerites gobble up the little book? Oh yeah. Was it sweet? Ooh, it was so sweet. Why was it sweet? Oh, Jesus is coming back. October 21st in 1843, then they readjusted it, and then finally they settled on, on October 22, 1844, and Jesus, I mean, Ellen White says that, that the coming of Jesus was something that brought joy to everyone. She said that that was the happiest year of her life, the year that led up to the great disappointment. So the experience was sweet. These people loved Jesus. They wanted to see Jesus come. And then when October 22, 1844 ended, ooh, the bitterness. I'm going to read you some statements from the pioneers after Jesus didn't come. Wow. Their hopes were dashed. But they didn't totally lose hope because they went back to studying Scripture. And they said, we missed the fact that the judgment is going to have a heavenly phase before Jesus comes to take over the kingdom. In a parable, Jesus says that we are to be individuals that wait for the return of the master from the wedding. In other words, the wedding takes place in heaven, and we are there in absentia. And then Jesus comes to get his people, but he determines his kingdom before. The Millerites did not understand that. So the acid test of what this little book is, is found in history. It was fulfilled in history in 1844. Now interestingly enough, the eating of the little book in Revelation 10 clearly describes the judgment hour preaching of the Millerite movement and its subsequent disappointment. After the disappointment, John was told to what? Prophesy again. Prophesy again from where? Where did the prophecy come from the first time? From the little book. So he says you have to prophesy again from the little book because you didn't get it right the first time. And he was commanded then to what? Wow! To measure the temple. And what is the measuring of the temple? The investigative judgment. See, after the, after the disappointment, in the very next verse, you have the investigative judgment. By the way, when it says you must prophesy again, where is the message found in Revelation of prophesying again? Revelation chapter 14, 
the three angels' messages. In other words, after the disappointment, God's people were called upon to present another message from the book of Daniel. And that message had to do with the measuring of the heavenly temple, which is the investigative judgment. Concerning the unsealing of the little book, Ellen White remarks, It was the Lion of the tribe of Judah who unsealed the book and gave to John the revelation of what should be in these last days. Daniel stood in his lot to bear his testimony, which was sealed until the time of the end, now notice this, until the time of the end, when what? When the first angel's message should be proclaimed to, to our world. So what is the unsealing of, a, of the book? It is preaching what? The first angel's message, the hour of his judgment has come. These matters of our, are of infinite importance in these last days, but while many shall be purified and made white and tried, the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. The book of Daniel is unsealed in the revelation to John and carries us forward to the last scenes of this earth's history. So as we study the structure of the book of Daniel, we discover that Daniel is one book composed of two books. One book is self-contained, Daniel 1-7. through The chapters relate to each other in a chiastic fashion. And then Daniel 8-12 through amplifies the theme of the last verses of Daniel 7 in speaking about the 2300 days and the investigative judgment. Did you understand what we're studying? Yes. It's marvelous, isn't it? It's just how important is it to understand the structure? It's vital. You know, and people say, well, just love Jesus. Well, yeah, I think we need to love Jesus. That's good. So if it's just love Jesus, why don't we have only in the Bible, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son? If it's just a matter of loving Jesus, just give us one verse. The fact is that as we study these things, we love Jesus more and more. Because no human mind could have done this. No human mind could have devised this unity that exists in the book of Daniel. And God wants us to be prepared for the coming of Jesus. Now let's notice here, we have about ten minutes left, and so we can introduce our next study, and then we'll continue after we take a break. The origin, identity, mission, and message of the remnant. This will absorb the rest of our time. There is no passage in Scripture that better describes the origin, message, identity, and mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church than Revelation 10. This is a critically important chapter in the self-identity of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Let's read the passage so we have it clear in our minds. I saw still another mighty angel, he's not just an ordinary angel, he's a mighty angel, coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. Who do you think this angel is? Same description as Jesus in Revelation 1. It continues saying, he had a little book open. That doesn't capture the tense of the verb in Greek. The tense of the verb is having been opened. In other words, at some point previous to the angel descending from heaven, the book was closed and it was opened. He had a little book open, or having been opened, in his hand. And he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. There's a lot of speculation about the thunders in the Adventist church these days without any reason. There shouldn't be any speculation. We'll see. 
the angel whom I saw standing, this is verse 5, the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, which God is this? The Creator God. That there should be, and this is the New King James, delay no longer. Terrible translation. The King James has it right. That there should be time no longer. But, in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, not when he sounds, but when the seventh angel is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished. So is the mystery of God going to be finished shortly before the seventh trumpet blows? Absolutely, very important. We're going to study all these things in detail. So once again, verse 7, But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servants the prophets. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. And it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. You say, now wait a minute, why do you have this reversed? Why does it say it's sweet in the mouth and bitter in the stomach? Why does it say bitter in your stomach and sweet in the mouth? There's a chiastic reason. We're going to see that. You need to know the structure. Verse 9 again. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. And it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And it was, now you have the right order, and as it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. So why do you have this, this order? You know, bitter, sweet, sweet, bitter. There's a structural reason for that. We're going to notice it. Verse 11, And he said to me, You must prophesy again. And the New King James says about. The King James says to, which I think is better. You must prophesy to, again, to many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Then I was given a read, and um, uh, this is, uh, you know, this is uh, verse 1 of chapter 11. It's really part of the passage. Then I was given a read like a measuring rod, and the angel stood by, saying, is it the same angel? Yeah, it's the same angel. Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. So do you have the picture clear in your mind? Okay, now let's summarize the little book episode. Let's look at the sequence of events in this chapter. Everything revolves around the angel and the little book. First of all, the mighty angel comes down from heaven to the earth. So I want you, I want you to visualize this, okay? The angel comes down from heaven to the earth. Then, next, his physical characteristics are described. His face shines like the sun, and his feet uh, are like burnished bronze. And then, he brings in his hand a scroll that is opened, which means that it was opened before he came down. He places one foot on dry land, and then he presses the other foot on the sea. Next, he speaks with the roar of the lion, and when he roars like a lion, seven thunders come out. He then swears the oath to the Creator, and he says that time will be no longer. Then he gives the book to John with instructions to eat it. After John eats it, and it's sweet in the mouth and bitter in the stomach, he instructs John to prophesy again. 
and after telling him to prophesy again, he commands John to measure the temple of God and those who worship God. And then the last point, which is not in the chronological order, but it is uh, the last point in the sequence. The mystery of God is finished when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet. Okay, do you have the sequence clear in your mind? See, we have to have the sequence clear. Now, let's take a look at the messenger that descends from heaven. The message of Revelation 10 is imparted by Jesus Christ Himself. So it must be extremely important. Jesus is described in the following terms. It is a mighty angel. His face is like the sun. The same description of Christ in, in Revelation 1.16. He is surrounded by a cloud like Jesus is surrounded by angels. His legs are like pillars of fire. Same description as Revelation 1. He roars like a lion. Who is Jesus? He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he has a rainbow over his head. Ellen White makes this interesting comment about the rainbow. She says, as the bow in the cloud results from the union of sunshine and shower, so the bow above God's throne represents the union of His mercy and His justice. To the sinful but repentant soul, God says, Live thou, I have found a ransom. Ellen White clearly identifies who this angel is. In the Adventist Bible Commentary, volume 7, page 971, she says, The mighty angel who instructed John was no less a personage than Jesus Christ. And she also says in the Bible Commentary, volume 7, pages 953 and 954, the instruction to be communicated to John was so important that Christ came from heaven to give it to His servant, telling Him to send it to the churches. So is this message of Revelation chapter 10 an extremely important message? Yes, because it is not delivered to an angel to be given to us, it is delivered by Jesus Christ Himself. It must be crucially important if Jesus comes down in person to reveal this to His servant John and to us who receive the message of John. So, I hope we have this uh, picture clear in our minds. Uh, we are going to take a look at the rest of the details of this chapter in our next session together. Don't miss it because it's going to be exciting.